Hello, finally. Yeah. Is my well, hard working? Yes, it is. Brilliant. Oh, yeah. Fantastic. Thank you all very much for coming to Rough Trade East this afternoon. I'm Natasha Sharp, and uh, I'd like to welcome Lord Tolhurst. Hi, guys. Hello. So, for those who don't know, Lowell helped found The Cure with frontman Robert Smith in 1976, and he's played on the band's key albums as well. He left in uh, 1989, but did briefly return to play on the Reflections Tour in 2011, and today we're going to be chatting about Lowell's memoir, which is called Cured, The Tale of Two Imaginary Boys. And there we are. And you can uh, buy a copy of that later, and Noel will be signing it as well. well. We will do a little reading a little bit later on, but I thought we'll start with a few questions first of all. So I guess sort of the main thing here is that uh, Cured is an account of your life, um, with emphasis obviously on the cure as well. Why did you decide to write this as a memoir rather than autobiography? Uh, well. Mainly I think uh, there, there are a lot of Cure fans who could probably write a better uh, autobiography because uh, that requires a lot of precision. And the thing about a memoir, as far as I'm aware, is it's, it's really more of you know, a story of how, you've, how things felt, how things were. And that's really the thing that I wanted to describe because that's the thing that uh, people can't know. They can't know how that was. And uh, the book is divided into three sections. And the first section um, is really the story of how we came to be the cure. It's not, um, you know, a, a blow by blow account of every concert. It, it's how the cure evolved out of how we were as people. Um, and that was actually the most enjoyable part for me to write because uh, it was like reliving uh, those memories. And, uh, you know, it felt very good to do that. Uh, the second part is really the part that probably, you know, people out here know and uh, that was the most difficult part because uh, you know I can remember a lot of things you know so there's a whole 40 year period in the book so I can remember a lot of things but um, to get them absolutely chronologically correct you know required a lot of research because you know you go from town to town to town to town and it might have been 1981 it might have been 1984 so you know you have to kind of uh, do some research and uh, so that's the part that's most like a, a sort of traditional sort of autobiography. And then the, the last part is really what happened after I left the cure. And, you know, brings you up to pretty much almost last year, I think. So um, a memoir was really the best format. And I guess there's a lot of people out there who probably don't know actually what did happen after you left the cure. So it's fantastic to right, actually be able to exactly, read that. Exactly. And I was interested, what inspired you to actually take that approach with the three sections as they were? Because you've done quite a lot of research reading other people's autobiographies and memoirs, haven't you? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I read probably nearly every uh, music autobiography memoir that I could get my hands on. Um, the ones that impress me the most are really the ones that are, are honest. Because I, I realised very early on, if you're not prepared to... Uh, tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, you're, you're not really going to write a very interesting book. You're going to write a, a kind of advert for yourself, but you're not going to really write something that uh, people can relate to. And uh, one book, which might surprise people, but uh, I found very good and sort of started me on the road and lots of things, was uh, Duff McKagan's from Guns N' Roses, his book. And uh, it was I, I, I realised that that was straight from the heart and, uh, and, and it felt right. So I, I contacted Duff and I asked him a lot of different questions about how he did things and uh, he, he was very forthcoming. So, uh, you know, that was, that was something that uh, helped me a lot. So about, you talk about the research that you actually did. What other research did you do? I mean, obviously you were looking up dates and things, but right. did you do any interviews with former members? Not really, no. No, I mean, you know, I, I've, I've talked to enough to everybody over my life. I don't need to interview anybody. You know, <laughs> I, I, I kind of know what they think about those things. I, you know, it's, it's funny, you know, every time I meet Robert, uh, we don't talk about the band, we talk about family, because I know his family very well, and he knows my family very well, and that's all we talk about. So, you know, to sit down and interview somebody, hey, what did you think about, you know, that, no, that's not going to happen, you know. So just, just relying on your, your own memories of things. Well, I've actually got the best memory out of everybody in, in the band. Yeah, 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 because, uh, 
we would do tours in the early days and, and Robert and Sarah said to me, what happened in Dusseldorf? Was that good? Did we, did we have a good show? And I, you know, somehow, you know, I remember most of it. Did you keep diaries at all? No, not at all, not at all. Um, you know, I think the thing is, you know, because back then, you know, I was an existentialist, you know, and I wasn't gonna, um, I wasn't going to record anything, I wasn't going to take any photos, I was going to live in the moment, which sounded like a very good idea at the time, but <laughs> probably a bit stupid, you know? Um, so, but, you know, memories are, are there's, they're slippery things, but they're also, I believe everything's here, you know? And uh, that was what was exciting about doing this, to excavate everything, because it becomes like dominoes, one after the other, you know? Once you, you remember one thing, you know, I'd wake up at four in the morning, and uh, you know, I said to my wife, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not going mad, but you know, I'm going to have to mumble into the iPhone to record this because otherwise I'll forget it. And uh, that's how I did a lot of the book like that. Were there any things that were particularly difficult to remember mm. in, in terms of things that you'd deliberately buried in the past? I think most people have got about 50% of their life that they, they want to you know, deliberately bury. Um, you know, I don't think you can remain sane without doing a bit of that, but uh, saying that in, in all seriousness, uh, a lot of what, what was brought up was quite hard for me, you know, emotionally, um, but I'm, I'm glad I did it. You know, it's, it's definitely uh, you know, it ha helped me write a better book, I feel. Yeah. And going back through the book, you obviously the, the prologue, it starts, I, I love this, because you explain how you and Robert Smith were Crawley's first punks. So I, I'm curious, what actually attracted you to punk in the first place? Because people don't think of The Cure as a punk band. Yeah, well, the, the thing was, you know, you have to remember that the early 70s in England was not the wonderful time that the, uh, the people that you know, wanted to leave, you know, Brexit and all that, that, that they remember. It was actually pretty dire. We had a three-day week, all kinds of things, and the music scene wasn't that great either. It was like either disco or it was, you know, very overblown prog rock, and um, neither of which, you know, resonated with us much. Um, and the other thing was, you know, we couldn't see a way uh, uh, how we could become musicians because everybody seemed very much removed from us and our own experience. Uh, and then punk came along and suddenly we saw a way out. You know, we saw, like, hey, we can do that. That that's, doesn't look that hard, you know? And, and we liked the, the enthusiasm that people had about it. You know, every week, every week there were, there were new singles coming out and uh, there was like sort of fairly preposterous bands like Eater starting up who were like, you know, 10 years old or something when they started. So we, we saw all these kind of things that we thought, we can use that, you know, we can use that energy. So, yeah, it was the attitude and the energy. I yeah, absolutely, so, yeah. absolutely. And I think it's, it's very interesting to read your, your memoir because there are so many books about the London punk scene, but here you are talking about a punk scene that isn't London, it's yeah, just no. outside. Yeah, and we, we, were, we were removed, but we were close enough to, to sense the energy, you know, coming and occasionally we come and see you know, shows up here, but uh, we were kind of allowed to... Uh, develop in our own way, you know, without the sort of the, the cut and thrust of like, oh, well, what's, what's, you know, you have to say that a lot of it was very fashionable. And so, you know, what was fashionable this week might not be fashionable next week. Well, we bypassed all of that, you know. And you were going to read a little section from the book sure. as well, yeah. um, which I guess kind of fits in quite neatly with that. T I, tell I me think it should, yeah. Yeah, tell yeah. me a little bit about, um, Tell me a little bit more about that, please. It's from chapter four, isn't it, from the book? Yeah, yeah, it's uh, the chapter four is the Lost Boys of Suburbia. You know, it basically, the bit I'll read describes how the summer of 1976 was a, a big turning point for us as The Cure. It was, it was really where we, we started realizing we could do something. And uh, I have to give you a couple of notes about some names in here, because, uh, oh, yes, if I may. Um, It's all right, we'll find it. <laughs> we'll find it, it's in there somewhere. Okay. Yeah, well, yeah um, in this reading I'm going to refer to somebody called uh, the Guru, who you might know. Uh, that's Robert's brother, but that's what we, we called him, the Guru. So that's who the Guru is in this bit. We were teenagers, just starting to consider life as adults. It was a summer I would never ever forget. For one thing, 
we finally had our own room to practice, despite the many attempts of the Smith's neighbours to shut us down. One day the doorbell rang, and there stood a portly, red-faced, middle-aged man. Your son and his friends are making that noise, yes? If you mean their band rehearsal, then yes, that's them, Robert's mother replied. Well, whatever it's called, it's got to stop. They're disturbing the community. I can't hear myself think with that bloody racket going on. Rita considered this for about a millisecond. Well, I'll tell them to stop playing when you tell your dog to stop pooing on my lawn. <laughs> and with that, she firmly closed the door on the matter, and the cure had in Rita Smith our first champion. Of course, the neighbour was quite right. We were disturbing the community, but that had been our intention all along. In the middle of that road-melting summer, Alex and Rita Smith decided to go on holiday, leaving Robert in charge of the house and environs. A little unwise on reflection. We were delighted by this development and immediately sprang into action. We knew exactly what was going to happen now. Band camp. College was on holiday and I had accrued a few days off from Hellerman, so with some careful planning, we could play at the house for at least a week. A week or more of non-stop bliss for us. Outside, the thermometer was creeping towards 90 degrees, an unheard of temperature in England. We had abandoned the stuffy annex to take up residence in the Smith's dining room, because there was a smidgen of air blowing through the house that we could trap there and use to cool the practice sessions. Many cables snaked across the dining room floor as we wired up everything we owned to make as much noise as possible. Connecting all of our instruments together took a while, but the resulting cacophony was surely worth it. We had bought a green Roland echo box, which we could feed all the vocals through to give us what we thought was a very professional sound. The heat was intense, so I stripped my shorts and t-shirt for banging drums. We found the heat also required that we drink copious amounts of liquid to keep hydrated. Of course, this also meant we had to make frequent forays to the local pub during breaks in our band practice. The Grey Fox pub had an atmosphere familiar to any inhabitants of late 1970s England. Just having the temerity to walk into the pub was enough to enrage one of the local drunks. They were mostly bleary-eyed middle-aged men whose light had been extinguished years before and now sought to intimidate and bully those who crossed their path. This usually meant anyone coming into the pub they didn't know personally. These guys didn't have a lot of friends. A loud, red-faced man playing harmonica very badly dropped the instrument from his lips as soon as we entered. He swiveled his head around, and with one squinty eye, scouted out anyone that might be offended by his ineptitude on the instrument. What are you fucking looking at? He slurred. Once he caught your gaze, he would violently hurl his glass on the ground, or, more spectacularly, at the mirrored back of the bar, and start to fight anyone who came into range. We stayed clear. He was like a captive monkey, playing to the crowd that was entirely inside of his head. Yes. We had plenty of examples of the type of people we definitely didn't want to become in Crawley pubs in the summer of 1976. I walked across the carpeted room and out onto the patio beyond. It had been so hot for so long we had almost forgotten what England was normally like. This was a country woefully unprepared for a summer like the one of 1976. There was no air conditioning to speak of and precious few ice making facilities. We sweated it out night after night and day after day. The tar on the streets resembled a molten black river. Kids sneaked eggs out of the fridge to throw on the ground and watch them fry in the sun. We were gawky adolescents just getting used to our not quite adult bodies and minds. And like many teens, we were trying to find our way through a jungle of such conflicting information. We spent a long time that summer on the Smith's patio looking out over the guru's chickens clucking away at the back of the garden. Most of the time we played records from his collection outside on the little portable from which we would glean various truths of rock and roll history and try on different styles. This was where certain elements of what was to become the Cure's signature sound came from, and some of it will surprise people. For instance, one LP on steady rotation that summer was Mahavishnu Orchestra's second album, Birds of Fire. Other contenders included Nils Lofgren's Cry Tough and the usual Brit rock stalwarts like Pink Floyd, The Beatles and The Stones. We all had our personal favourites. I recall Robert particularly liked Captain Beefheart's Trout Master Replica. We were devoted acolytes of much that had come before, 
plundering the guru's precious back catalogue of rock and roll history. More than anything else, we were united in our general dislike of most of the overblown pap that masqueraded as progressive music, plus the fact it all seemed so far removed from our own experience growing up in Crawley. I, I couldn't imagine the Moody Blues having a running battle with racist skinheads in their hometown streets. Then again, they came from Birmingham, so who knows. As the Smiths holiday wore on, we spent more and more time bashing out our sound in their dining room. I had the Pearl Max Wing kit my first and I loved it. Besides the aforementioned Marshall, Robert had added a brown Gibson Explorer guitar. A copy I hastened to add as none of us could afford the real thing at that point. British amplification and American guitar. The archetypal rock and roll setup. Michael completed his array with a brown guild bass and Paul with his black Les Paul copy. We were ready to make a lot of noise and we did. In between songs, we drank the Smith's home brew and sometimes smoked gitans in their beautiful blue box. When hungry, a trip to the fish and chip shop sufficed. It was a beautiful time, without artifice or pretense. We were discovering our art. Life was very simple and pure. Robert and I got ready for rehearsal by sneaking into the guru's room when he wasn't about and playing a couple of tracks. Robert was flipping through the albums on the shelf when he asked me if I'd heard Ray Charles hit the road jack. No, I don't think so. He put it on the guru's expensive turntable. We listened intensely for a couple of minutes. Pretty bloody great, right? He grinned. Yes, it's brilliant, I agreed. We were in awe of the power of that piano riff. Total genius. Thank you. It just interfered with the, the, the flow, not because there were things that I didn't want to tell people. Um, no, there, there's a million, million stories. You know, I, I, oh, but I didn't want to be like Bob Dylan with his chronicles, you know, you know sort of you know, write 10 books about the same thing. Um, no, I mean, I will write another book, but it, you know, it might have some of the other stories in. So watch this space. <laughs> yes, right, exactly. Yeah. So did any of your former bandmates know that you were writing memoir? Yeah, everybody knew, and, and I told Robert back in about 2013 or something, I think, yeah. Did, was anyone a bit worried? Oh, I don't think so. I no. think they, they trust me enough to know that I'm, uh, you know, trustworthy. I, I really love the way that uh, Robert is painted in the, in the book, particularly he's so... Um, the way that he behaves as a teenager, he's very kind of... Um, like a, an old head on young shoulders, particularly the way that he, when you, after you left Hansa, he um, made sure that you still had the rights to the songs and also he made sure that the first advance that you got was rationed out, you were paying right. yourselves a salary. It's such unusual behaviour when you consider that he was he was young at the time. You were all young Yeah, we were all very young. I mean, we, we really sort of started doing all that stuff when we were about 15 or 16. Um, the, the thing about Robert is, you know, on one hand, he's the, the, the person that you think he might be from what you would see on stage and how you would see, but he's also a very pragmatic person. And, uh, you know, that comes from his father, you know, it's very like that. And, uh, you know, he, he was just very logical about what we should do. And uh, it seemed to be right, you know. And, and it's certainly the right decision. Well, yeah, it saved me a lot of uh, yeah. heartache through the years, that's for sure, yeah. And of course, the other the big connection with this particular book is uh, Pearl Thompson, formerly known as Paul Thompson, right. who designed the cover art. Yeah, right. He did all the cover art and um, you know, all the stuff inside and stuff. Yeah. And it's the first sort of cure related thing that he's done for a while, isn't it? Well, yeah. I mean, you know, he was. Uh, I'm not going to spoil it because there's a bit about the book in it. So it it's about it yeah. in the book. Um, so I won't say more. But um, you'll find out when you read the book. <laughs> And I think it's testament to The Cure's innovative sound and style that they still continue to inspire 40 years on. Does it surprise you that that legacy is still going? Um, the, the me now sitting in front of you, no it doesn't. The, the me that was 16 years old would have been completely and utterly amazed, yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I'm very, when, when I think about that, I, I'm humbled and I'm flattered at the same time, you know. It's, and if anybody's got any questions that you'd like to ask, I've got to keep an eye out for questions. Anybody? Okay, I shall ask one of my own then. You've, you've played both drums and keyboards, and I wondered which one do you prefer? Um, I, like, I like the physicality of drums, and, and drums are uh, 
you know you can you can make like a sort of mantra out of it it's like dancing you know if you if you do it right it's uh really rewarding and if you do it badly it can be very exhausting so uh but i always like that um you know the thing the thing that's really i'm interested in is sounds you know so keyboards have access to all of the sounds in the world and uh, i was very interested in that and I still am but uh, it's two different sides you know so it's, it's like sacred and profound you know it's uh it, it, it's something that takes us out of being who we are and and that really is what i'm always after that's what i was after with the book the book took me out of being me here now you know it took me into a different world and for that you know it was a, a, a different kind of vehicle but it's the same thing they're all the same thing really okay a any questions yes yeah, i would like to ask you a question about how at the beginning of the cure you felt about bad criticism there is something which everybody knows about the john peel session where you had the song desperate journalist where it was a critic of a critic of the album of the cure how was it for you that people might not like what you were doing? Well, uh, that's actually a very good question. Um, I think it would be worse nowadays because uh, you have the internet, you know, and there, there's there's room for people to just you know run around and say whatever they like about everybody and have no consequences for it. You know, back in the days, you know, if somebody would come and tell us what they thought about us. Well, if it was good and, and it was nice, yeah, we, we, you know, that would be a pleasant experience. And if they weren't so nice to us, it might be a very unpleasant experience for them, depending on how we felt. But um, <laughs> no, we were always very nice to people, um, even the bastards. Um, yeah, it, no, it, 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 of course it affects you because uh, it, it's uh, a comment about you from somebody you don't know it's, it's kind of like having a thief come in your house and steal something but i say that over over the years you get to have a, not a thick skin but you get to be able to uh, mediate that and realize well it's not really about you it's more about them you know does that make sense it's more about how they feel about things which is fine they can feel like that but i don't have to feel like that so yeah Anybody else any questions? Really? No. no oh, yes, yeah. a lady. Yeah. <laughs> yes, uh, what's, what type of mu musical bands do you listen to at the moment? What do you particularly like? Something that came out recently? Uh, uh, well, yeah, I listen to all kinds of things. Mostly I listen to stuff that I have a son. My son's 24 <coughs> and he's a musician as well. And. Uh, he has his finger on the pulse of what's going on because you know a lot of people my age will turn around and say oh you know music uh, it's not as good now as it used to be and, and i always tell them no that's not true all, all that's happened is you don't know where to find it anymore you know you you've forgotten how you found music and uh, so i rely on my son and he he you know pops things into me I, there was something i liked recently it was electronica caribou you've heard them right yeah and uh, that was very good. I mean, I, I listen to lots of different things. I listen to some old stuff as well, you know, and uh, I read a lot, though. That's what I do a lot. What have you been reading recently, apart from memoirs and autobiographies? Not much else besides those, actually. I mean, there's lots of... Uh, Viv Albertine's uh, book I thought was particularly brilliant and uh, good, and I really enjoyed that. didn't enjoy Pete Townsend so much, but I enjoyed Viv Albertine's. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes? I guess going with that, and I've, I've already read a bit of the book, um, and I listened to Black Sabbath yesterday, and you say at one point, you know, people said you all played Black Sabbath and you didn't really know, but actually this kind of dark sound, which kind of happened just before Punk and The Cure in right. England, in Birmingham, right. was that something that influenced The Cure? at all or did you say no nothing to do with heavy metal no no i well i could tell you something that that's it's not in the book but that's a truth um when we were at school you know 13 14 i was like the unofficial dj at lunchtime right and i can remember playing um the first sabbath album so obviously there's some stuff and you know they're they're for me, I, I'm a purist, really, in that way. I like the people that did it first, every time. That's, that's you know, if I was going to wear, well, I'm not actually wearing Levi's. I, I was going to say that. If I was going to wear jeans, I would wear Levi's, but I'm not. But, um, 
So that was lied to that, right? Um, but music, yeah, music like that, you know, anything that's uh, been around for a time or has affected a lot of people, you have to be affected by it, you have to like. I mean, you know, me and my wife, we went to see the Peach Boys the other day. I had never seen them, and they were great. You know, you know every single song they've ever done as well, you know, for three hours. But, you know, it's not what I listen to on a daily basis, but all kinds of people like that. And I, and I started to do a lot of that with my son as he was growing up. I started to take him to see people that I thought, you know, I said, you, you better come and see them now because they might be dead or, or not touring, you know. So I said, you've got to find them sooner or later, but let's go and see them now. So I took him to see Kraftwerk, I took him to see Terry Riley and, you know, all kinds of things. So... Um, yeah, you're you're right. There, there's some influences, but but it wasn't a, a question of us throwing that. It, we were more throwing away things like the Moody Blues, really. That's what we were throwing away. No, no Sabbath, still again. Right on. <laughs>